So, um, hello everyone who have joined us today. Um, we'll be waiting for a couple of more minutes to see if there are any more uh, people who will be joining us. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll be waiting for five or six minutes or so, and then we will continue with some. Thanks. Okay, um, so it seems that we might not be having any more um, audience. So we'll start now. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone present here. My name is Saurav. I'm from Stellar Universe. So today we'll be going to have a talk by Sabura Zamani. She's a uh, MSc physics student from Golestan University, Iran. She'll be talking on gravitational lensing, formalism, and applications in astrophysics and cosmology. So uh, I hope you guys will enjoy this talk and try to learn as much as possible. And also, if you have any questions, you can just put it at the end of the session uh, for after 45 minutes or so. So over to you, Sabura, now. OK. Um, hi everyone. 
Today, I want to talk about gravitational lensing formulas and its application. Mm, there aren't many relativistic topics in my talk, and I just try to focus on the basics and also important parts of gravitational lensing. First, uh, we have a very brief review about the history and definition of gravitational lensing, and then mm, we will talk about the theory and applications. What is the definition of gravitational lensing? As we know, one of the predictions of general relativity is that light uh, does not just travel in a straight line, but its path is bent by gravity. And this effect leads us to a phenomenon that we call it gravitational lensing. We have three classes of gravitational lensing, the strong, weak, and micro. Um, in a strong, the lens mass density is above a critical value, and the geometry is suitable. Uh, this type of lensing is strong enough to produce two or more separate images of the source, and uh, produce arcs or Einstein rings. Um, I told critical value, um, that uh, has a mm, relation, simple relation that you can find in the reference. It's not something complicated. Um, weak lensing. For those structures um, where the density in the lens lies below that critical value that I mentioned, um, multiple images cannot be formed. The distortion of background sources are much smaller and can only be detected by analyzing large number of sources to find the um, coherent distortion of only a few percent. So the lens is a large mass, but uh, it is an um, Intrinsically a statistical measurement. Oh, sorry. Uh, micro. In, in micro lensing, the lens is a small mass, usually a star. And so that although the geometry is extremely suitable, mm, I mean, source, lens, and observer in a straight line. Uh, the deflection, distortion, and multiple images caused by lensing cannot be resolved. That means no distortion in shape can be seen. But the amount of light received from the background object changes in time. And for understanding better, this is a simulation um, of a uh, microlensing effect. If you look at the diagram, when the lens gets near to the source, we have a peak in our brightness. I think it's better to play it again. Yeah. So, um, that was um, somehow an uh, introduction. Um, but let's just know a little more about history. Um, nowadays, the behavior of light rays in a gravitational field must be described with Einstein's theory of general relativity. But long before the creation of this theory, however, it was suspected that gravity influences the behavior of light. In 1801, the Munich astronomer J. Saldner published a paper and expressed that he found a deflection angle relation and for sun is equal to 0 0.87, as you see in equation one. And in 1950, um, Einstein obtained twice the previous value, as you see in equation two, and it was uh, equal to 1.7 arc seconds for the sun. 
1919, um, Eddington measures the deflection angle for the sun equal to 1.6, and that was confirming general relativity. Although these first measurements were not very precise, um, they contain errors about 30% uh, for the deflection angle, I guess. And the Newtonian value could clearly be rejected. In 1937, Fritz Zwicky predicted that mass distribution such as a galaxy could um, act as a gravitational lens, not only bending light, but also distorting images of objects lying beyond the gravitating mass. And in 1979, uh, Zwicky's theory was confirmed through the observation of twin quasars. And this object becomes the first confirmed example of a gravitational lens in history. And as you see in the in this picture, it shows with um, that small picture here. So um, this is a picture of this twin quasar. The top left um, photo shows the quasar more precisely. And uh, the right image shows its magnitude. I can zoom here. It's these two, this twin quasar. And this is the magnitude. And that's it. So we start our first section that is gravitational lensing formalism. Um, if you want to know how we can obtain equation one, if you remember this equation, we want to um, know how we can calculate it. And we consider a point particle with a mass m passing by a compact object with much larger mass, the big M. And if gravity is the only force acting on the particle, then the relevant equation is equation 3, as you see here. And um, equation 4 is, um, it's nothing complicated. It's equation 3, but in polar coordinates. And the phi component of equation 4 leads to a conservation law for angular momentum as you see in five. Um, by little calculation, uh, the equation of motion for R becomes um, equation six. And if we define U as one over R and rewrite the equation in terms of U, then that leads us to a remarkably simple equation for U that is equation eight. And I should note that um, prime denotes derivative with respect to phi and dot uh, with respect to time. Next slide we have dot, yeah. Um, and therefore the solution for equation four is equation nine. If you remember equation four, the solution for this equation is equation nine. And um, I should remember we used two tricks. And um, the first one was using conservation law for angular momentum. And the second one was defining U parameter as one over R. That helps us to um, reach the solution. Before going further, we look at the value of the conserved quantity Jz. At very early times, I think it's better to see this image. At very early times, when the particle is still far away from the lensing mass, 
R is very large and P is small. It's really small. So, I mean, at this sign, um, R is um, big and P is small. So, um, with a very good approximation, P is equal to B over R and um, where B is impact parameter. And uh, the particle moves uh, horizontally, so the change in P is due uh, to the change in R. And um, by this, we have equation 10 here. I mean, these are not but something different. That's just a derivation, yeah. So that's, I talked about it, but we use it um, a little later again. Um, so we can rewrite our solution as equation 11. We have this solution, number nine, by this simplification, we have number 11 um, equation. It remains to determine the two parameters A and P0 that are dictated by initial conditions. The first condition is that when R goes to infinity, then P is equal to zero. And the second condition is on the initial velocity, which by a little calculation leads us to A, as you see here. And if uh, we imagine uh, phi zero is equal to 19, A is equal to one over B, and at the end, um, we can find um, Newtonian deflection angle, as you see um, equation 40. Uh, it's good before continuing our discussion, know a little about the angular geometry distance. Now, uh, in the simple case with the Euclidean background metric that we are considering here, for example, if I want to show you the next slide, uh, here, uh, DDS, if you want to know DDS, is equal to DS minus DD, and so we have the Yes, it's in Euclidean background. Um, however, since gravitational lensing occurs uh, in the universe on large scales, we must use a cosmological model. There, distance does not have an unambiguous uh, meaning, but several distances can be defined in analogy with Euclidean laws. The distance dA must then be interpreted as angular diameter distance and the angular diameter distance for an object at the redshift z is expressed in terms of the co-moving distance as you see is dm and um yeah that's um if i want to say um uh, it's like if you imagine the universe without expansion, that Euclidean background, um, angular diameter distance is this, and universe with expansion, that's um, the thing that we have. I mean, the real thing, um, angular diameter distance is this. But in our calculation in next slide, uh, we imagine universe without expansion. Um, Schwarzschild lensing system is the simplest one. That's why we are going to check it. The gravitational lensing geometry for a point mass lens M, that is our lens, and that's at a distance dd from our observer. And um, our source, S is at distance ds 
from our observer uh, has angular separation beta from the lens. And um, a light ray from the source which passes the lens at the distance Kc is deflected by alpha, as you see here. And the observer sees an image of the source at the angular position theta. Here, something like here. The condition that this ray reach the observer is obtained solely from the geometry of the picture, as you see in equation 17, that I think is clear. Um, and by using equation 17 and this relation, we have equation 19. And um, simply we can reach the lens equation that is equation 20. And that is for Strauss lens. For simplification, we introduce these parameters as you see in lens and source plane. And that's not nothing, nothing difficult. That's just some namings. And by applying this simplification to our lens, we have equation 23 and its solution. The ray trace equation has two solutions of opposite signs. This means that the source has an image of each side of the lens. But in previous slides, we just show the one side of it. By subtracting the results of equation 24, we have an angular separation between the images and that's equation 25. And the true angular separation between the source and the deflector is related to image position, and that is equation 26. Um, as you see in the picture, it's like we just have uh, the part with a yellow dashed line. As I told you, that we have one side of the image, uh, but it's just two images. And um, yeah, but I mean, the true one is this. Um, there is a special situation that um, when source, lens, and observer are collinear, that means beta is equal to zero. In this case, there is no preferred plane for the light rays to propagate. But the whole configuration is uh, rotationally symmetric about the line of sight to the lens. So the solutions, 24, if you remember this solution, is just equal to uh, minus plus alpha. But uh, because we have symmetry, in this special case, the whole ring of angular radius, and um, we, we don't have a minus plus, we just have a theta equal to alpha zero. And that's the solution for the lens equation in this special case. Uh, this figure shows everything we said up to here, from multiple images to Einstein rings. And by this, we, um, up to now, we were talking in the Newtonian frame. And Newtonian gravity can be expressed in statistic, uh, static weak field metric, in which time and space are slightly curved. And we assume approximately flat. Um, now we treat uh, space-time that is distorted by gravity, so it is curved. We are interested in understanding how the path of a massless particle, um, massless particle, I mean photons, is distorted by gravitational field. We assume that the photon begins its motion traveling along the z-axis, and because we want to calculate the distortion, so that means it will 
uh, acquire a small non-zero value of uh, x and y. The geodesic equation is, as you see here, in the equation 27, the lambda is a prime parameter and the Latin indicates run over two dimensions. Um, and for the reason that we said um, before, um, the Greek indicates, uh, sorry, for the reason that I said a little while ago, um, the Latin indicates um, run over two dimension and Greek indicates run over four dimension. The right hand side of equation 27, this, the right hand side of this, uh, can be expressed as uh, the four momentum. Um, so we have um, equation 29. And after computing the Christopher symbols, in the end, we have the deflection angle that is predicted by Einstein. As you see, the deflection angle predicted by general relativity is twice as large as the Newtonian prediction. Now we have enough uh, ammunition uh, for a brief diversion to compute the Shapiro time delay. Our line element for a massless particle is equation 31. For simplicity, we imagine light rays are traveling along the z-axis, passing near the sun, and the metric is given by equation 32, as you see here. And in a small time dt, um, massless particle massless particles um, traverse a small coordinate distance dz given by equation 33 um, and that's just a expanded form it's nothing um, different and the shopper time delay is equation um, 34 here we calculate specifically for the sun, but the relation that is um, this, I mean, for totally shorter time delay. And um, as we said before, gravity um, changes the path of light and this cause to make um, Time passes slower around any mass. Here is a comparison between Newtonian and GR frame. And um, the left side is on perturbed light rays in a flat space time. And the right side is deflection and delay in a um, vicinity of a non rotating mass of radius. Um, Rs equal to 2 gm um, over c in power 2. That's Schwarzschild length, um, Schwarzschild radius. So, um, the second part of my talk is about gravitational lensing application. As we said before, gravitational lensing has a lot of uses. These are some of its application, and some of them that are more cosmological are shown in a darker color. Um, I just um, show that in case you want to know, but I'm not talking about this. We have for a strong, weak, these darker or more cosmological applications and for micro. Mm, some of the applications that are a little more important, uh, they're listed below and um, we can use gravitational lensing for dark matter studies, mass distributions, large scale geometry of the universe, we can find hover parameter or other cosmological parameters. 
and we can use it for testing dark energy models or it can magnify distance object for us and act as a natural telescope. So um, one of the uses, as we said, is um, um, dark matter. Gravitational lensing provides a powerful way to probe the distribution of matter in the universe, particularly dark matter, over a wide range of scales, and that's really important. About 85% of the matter in the universe is in the form of dark matter, whose nature remains a mystery, and the rest is of the kind found in atoms. Dark matter exhibits gravity, but does not interact with normal matter, nor does it emit light, but um, as we said, it is interact with gravity, so by using differences between the mass that we get from data and the mass that uh, predicted by the luminosity of the lens, we can measure the dark matter. Um, so we use, um, in this image, we use uh, weak lensing for um, show the dark matter. Um, this map of dark matter in the universe was obtained from data from the kids survey using the VLT survey. It reveals an expansive web of dense and that's light uh, ones and empty regions, they are dark ones. Uh, this image is one out of five patches of the sky observed by kids. Here, um, the invisible dark matter is seen rendered in pink, covering an area of the sky around 420 times um, the size of the, moon, of the full moon. This image reconstruction was made by analyzing the light collected from over 3 million distance galaxies, more than 6 billion light years away. The observed galaxy images were wrapped by a gravitational pool of dark matter as the light traveled through the universe. Some small dark regions with sharp boundaries appear uh, in this image. They are the location of bright stars and the other near nearby objects that um, get in the way of the observations. Uh, of more distant galaxies, and um, hence, and they mask out these maps, as no weak lensing signal can be measured in these areas. So that's, we don't have weak lensing in those, we don't catch weak lensing in those areas. This is two views from Hubble of the massive galaxy cluster. CL double um, 0025 plus 17. Um, to the left is the view in visible light with odd looking blue arcs appearing among the yellowish galaxies. These are uh, the magnified and distorted images of galaxies located far behind the cluster. The light is bent and amplified by the immense gravity of the cluster in a process um, that we know it is gravitational lens. And the right side, a blue shading has been added to indicate the location of an invisible mater uh, material called dark matter that is mathematically required to account for the nature and placement of gravitation gravitationally lens galaxies that are seen. Another application, as you said, is um, finding Hubble parameter. Today estimates of Hubble parameter based on CFAs and the CMB 
radiation have uncertainty about 10% um, on the conservative assumption that the universe may not be perfectly flat. Gravitational lens time, time delay measurements can produce some uh, less uncertain estimates. But finding a convenient system has some difficulties, and I'm not going uh, to talk about these difficulties. So we said that gravitational lenses offer such an alternative and potentially cleaner method. The principle is as follows. First, uh, suppose the background source is variable. Uh, I mean, it brightens and fades. And suppose that at a given time, it undergoes a sudden brightening. Uh, this will, of course, mean that the observer will see each of the multiple images brighten. However, the light paths, which um, correspond to each of the multiple images, will be slightly different because each path has um, taken a slightly different trajectory through the lensing galaxy. If we determine that image A is brightened one day later or one year later, for example, um, later than image B, uh, this means that uh, the length of the light path producing image A must be one light day longer than producing image B. In the other words, this delay allows us to measure in absolute distance within the system, and that's related to Hubble parameter, so we can calculate it and we can measure it. And this is uh, different measurements of Hubble parameter. As you see, Hubble parameter is different in early and late universe techniques, and um, this difference is called Hubble tension. Gravitational lensing is based on later universe techniques. And it's important to measure Hubble parameter with different methods to find the answer for this tension, to know why. And the one that defined with dashed arrow is the technique um, based on gravitational lensing, H0LICOW, this. The technique is based on lensing. And this is something that is new. So if uh, I want to say a summary, um, for measuring Hubble constant, we should uh, measure the light travel time and then measure and model the potential and then infer the time delay distance and convert it into cosmological parameters. And you can see these steps in something like this. Light travel time, model and potential, and convert it into cosmological parameters. And that's the references. And my talk is finished, and thank you really for listening. If you have any question, I can answer. And if you don't have, so. Hello. Yeah.
Um, yeah, you can uh, take questions, Sabura. I guess if you can see on the YouTube, but if you want me to tell you. Now I'm saying thank you. But I can't see any question. I don't think. Um, there are, um, you can see. Otherwise, if I can read it to you. Yeah, if you do that, thank you. Yeah, um, so first question is um, by Siddharth. He's asking why there are two peaks of brightness in the first graph. Um, you mean on? Um, I guess he's referring to the, um, the very first curve. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. I think. Um, you mean this? Can you read the question again, please? Yeah. Or He's asking me? why there are two peaks of brightness in the first graph. Um, so as I told you, that's um, how my, um, microlensing works. You know, mm, we said that. Um, for example, when we have a strong lensing, the background um, galaxies or other things distorted. But uh, in micro is like this. Uh, our lens that is um, have a that is bright a little maybe. Uh, it goes um, um, when it gets near from the source um the um, lens bright uh, brightness it's something like uh plus the source brightness and uh because of that we have um more brightness than normal and as it's uh at, as um, the lens goes far so that's we have just our source uh brightness you know I hope that I tell it um, good. So the another one, is there any? Yeah, um, another one is by Priyam Vada. She's asking, apart from distribution of dark matter, can any other information about the nature of dark matter be obtained from gravitational lensing? Um, I don't know that about the nature of the dark matter, but um, because you know we said that um, we understand there is a dark matter because uh, it um, interact with gravity. I mean, um, because of that, we understand that there is um, dark matter. But if we want to know something more about it, um, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, my, um, well, I don't know it's, if it's correct or not. But uh, maybe we can understand uh, more about dark matter uh, with the regions that we um, get it. You know, for example, um, in some regions we get it more and um, we can. Um, study more about that why it's like more here and maybe something is different from um, the other places but um i don't know um also um i think um, you can't determine the nature of dark matter by lensing alone um, I think only the existence and distribution. I think, yeah. Okay. Um, 
So um, the next question is by Ananya. She's asking, can you please elaborate on co-moving distance? Uh, sorry, what? Elaborate on co-moving distance. Um, you mean co what is uh, co-moving distance is um, a distance um, that um, moving with um, I mean you have um, the universe is expansion is expanding and um, the observer moving with the expansion that distance that measure is the common distance and um i don't know if it's it was clear or not <laughs> um let me say in another word um common distance maybe mm, it is a distance that measure by an observer moving with an expansion that's it yeah okay um, you um, know if, um something you use it in um, mathematics you know when you want to calculate and something like this but the um, physical meaning is just the distance measured by an observer moving with the expansion. So, okay. Um, so, the next question is by Surinj. He's asking um, Do you assume a cosmological model while obtaining the Hubble constant from Shapiro time table? Uh, why? You said why? No, I said, do you assume any uh, cosmological model while obtaining the Hubble constant from Shapiro time today? Um, um, no, as a, um, I told you, um, let me, uh, if we want to use a cosmological model, if we have to use um, we we should consider universe uh, with expansion, you know. Uh, but for Shapiro time delay, mm, that is here. Uh, I didn't um, um, I didn't use any um, cosmological model because if you see the metric is um, is something like near flat because you know shopper time delay is um is uh, something um, that is relativistic but it's work at um newtonian limits so it is um in it's not that much used to um assume a cosmological model, but uh, yeah, we can assume usual lambda CDN model. Yeah, if if I want to say, uh, if we assume uh, the um, cosmological model, um, yes or not? Yeah, we assume usual lambda CDN model. Uh, I got your um, question wrong at first. Sorry. Okay, um, so next question is, does dark matter interact with antimatter? Dark matter interacting with antimatter? Um, yeah. In, I think dark matter, antimatter, no. Dark matter does interact with uh, Mm, yeah, if we want to say, yeah, uh, by gravity, because, you know, mm, we understand um, the existence of dark matter by its interaction with uh, gravity. 
so um, yeah it can um, interact with antimatter by gravitation okay uh, next question is by Karnika she is asking what does the gravitational lensing say about dark matter um you know it's uh gravitational lensing as i told you is um we can't see dark matter and um gravitational lensing is something um, is simple and it's natural and um it shows um the interaction something that we don't know what is it we name it dark matter um and with gravity so we can see um the the there is ex that dark matter exists mainly uh it's distribution and existence of the dark matter mm, gravitational lensing shows the distribution and existence yeah if i want to say it short Okay, yeah. Um, next question is: um, What is the actual difference between normal matter and antimatter? What is the actual what? What is the difference between normal matter and antimatter? Oh, normal matter and antimatter, and that's normal matter, and the other one is antimatter. <laughs> um, I don't know that much about that. It's not mm, something that I know. It's not that much related about lensing, no. But um, yeah, I should. Okay. I can answer it a little bit later. I should think about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess um, we have the. Last question, is it possible to form a material from dark matter? Uh, sorry, what? Is it possible to form a material from dark matter? Is it possible to? Sorry, your voice is. Is it possible to form a material from dark matter? Um. Yeah, I mean, you. Oh, you mean the um, you mean to understand what is dark matter? The question is if it's um, yeah maybe. Uh, um, sorry, uh, the la um, the um, a previous question about um, matter and time matter. Um, Antimatter um, is like normal one, uh, but uh, with different charge. And um, it's the same mass, but uh, opposite charge. And the last question, I didn't understand it really. Um, this was okay. the answer to the previous one. But I don't know the last answer, the last question. What was this? Okay, um, so I guess there are no more before, there are no further questions. Um, so I guess we shall end the talk here itself. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Sabura, for such an enlightening and such a wonderful talk on gravitational lensing. Thank you. I hope everyone must have enjoyed that. So um, I guess now we'll be taking. So now we'll be taking. Uh, we'll be signing off, and I hope you guys will be joining us tomorrow for our next talk. Uh, it will be based on a similar topic, which is related to deflection angle of light, but it will be talking around a black hole and that to uh, a different type of black hole that I must say by Shivam Kala. And the day after tomorrow, which is on Friday, we'll be having talk by uh, Nidhi Saini. She'll be talking about fast radio bursts. And finally, on Saturday, we're going to have talk by uh, Rishabh Chan. He'll be talking on adaptive adaptive op optics. So, okay. Thank you so much.
And if you guys have any more further questions, um, we can just drop uh, her email, Sabura's email, and you guys can interact with her. Or if you want to have any further questions, you can drop your comments in the uh, questions as comments in this particular video. Thank you so much for joining us.